Welcome back. This is your host, Gabe Morales, tracking Mexican Mafia members over the past 60 plus years, A through Z. The lesson of today is heart, corazón in Spanish. Now, if you don't want to hear it, I suggest you fast forward, but you are probably missing the most important part of this video. I have repeatedly stated during these episodes, starting with the first one, that my information comes from validation lists by law enforcement not from me. I even had to make an advisory post at the beginning of this video because a lot of people want to take things out of context. I don't just make this stuff up, although I do sometimes slightly misquote the hard documentation that I have. It is easy to do. I'm only human, but as soon as I realize it, I clean it up. I think some of you have seen that. Unlike some people, I don't have a problem admitting I'm wrong, but some of you guys will come on here claiming that I'm wrong and you're right and then show little to no evidence of your belief. In other words, it comes down to my word against your word. I can only believe the documentation that I've seen and hope that those individuals did their homework. But when I put out stuff and somebody makes respectful inquiries about it, I always recheck it. But unless there's a glaring error, then I still stand by my information until proven wrong with valid legal paperwork. Sometimes I don't get the benefit of the doubt. That's okay. But when the homies are accused of wrongdoing, they usually hold court and are given a chance to be heard out. Their actions are often determined by some of the same criteria I use. They want to see 115s. They want to see 128s. They want to see police reports. They want to see court paperwork if a guy is accused of lying or being a rata. I am just a messenger here, a guy with what I think is above average information about these organizations although some people may debate that description of me. It doesn't matter. Really, there are only two main ways you're considered to be a carnal, and that is not by my decision. That is by validation systems of intel units, primarily the California Department of Corrections and the Bureau of Prisons, or by the big homies themselves. So if you have a problem with my information, take that up with those agencies, or take it up with the big homies themselves. They know who is who. They don't need me. I think I've stated before, there is sometimes contention between CDC and the BOP over who is legit. And as it was stated many times, sometimes they get it wrong, even using their very complex validation system. And even among the big homies, there is sometimes disagreement. That is in part why they made the Federal Commission in the BOP and La Mesa system in CDC, which will be mentioned when we get to Big Sleepy de Wilmas. The Mesa system was implemented after the Emmy edict went into effect and was enforced further under guys like Mariano Chuy Martinez, as was a recent question by one subscriber on this channel. I realize that all of these guys have family that love and care for them, and I try very careful not to disrespect anybody or purposely hurt anybody that might be related to them. But I also realize there's something called denial, and that is not a river in Egypt. Some of these guys' family and friends were enablers and are still in self-denial about that. Others may have tried to convince them not to do certain things, but ultimately we are all responsible for our actions on this earth and under heaven. So don't blame me if you got caught up in this madness. I take my work very serious and I don't make mention of individuals lightly here, but I found it ridiculous that a couple commenters insinuated that I could get people killed by doing this. There are lots of channels out there that I think do a far worse job of just throwing out information and often misinformation. Look, I don't know how else to say it. This information has been documented by law enforcement. So if I mention you, you most likely were already on their radar. That does not necessarily mean you were validated as a member, but I can't recall one person that I've mentioned in this series yet that doesn't have a criminal record because I have their CDC numbers and have looked at many of the criminal records and reports while they're in custody, including C-files. So I feel pretty confident that everybody here was at least suspected of being a member or of being a camarada, as in most cases, there was enough validation criteria mentioned to get them pegged as such. And very likely, they have also been locked down in a pinche oil for those acts. Over the course of my career, I personally put several individuals, including MM members and camaradas and members and associates of other prison gangs, into segregation with reports that I wrote based on facts. And after CDC 115 hearings, some of those individuals were given shoe terms. And I continued to write 128s when I had information that might help keep them there or collaborate other information given. And that wasn't just by informants. Like I said, I don't just take hearsay as proof. 
There has to be at least a couple other things listed on that gang criteria before I even mention them here. In over 40 years of tracking these guys, I have never gotten anybody killed. On the contrary, I have literally saved many lives inside the Pintas and outside on the street, where I do a lot of gang prevention and intervention work with youngsters. My sole purpose for these videos is not to glamorize the gang lifestyle, but to bring about more awareness. And I have a lot of videos in the gang prevention and intervention arena on this channel, if you want to check them out. By the way, if you think I'm getting rich off of all this, it may be hard to believe, but I'm a dinosaur. I am not tech savvy. It takes me about an hour to produce every one minute of video. That means come up with the material, research it, make sure it's accurate, record it, edit it, insert the pictures, and upload it. There's even more involved, unless you've made these kind of videos you don't even know how hard it is. YouTube pays me approximately one cent. That's right, approximately about a penny for every hit I get on these videos. This payment comes from advertisements posted during video plays. I have no control over those. YouTube does. That's how they stay in business, and that's how they pay content providers. So, if I get 200 views on a 20-minute more positive topic, then I get paid about $2. That equates to about 10 cents an hour. Yeah, I'm really hauling in the fatty here. If I get 10,000 views on what some people call more negative videos, like in this series, then I get about $100. That still only amounts to about $5 an hour for a 20-minute video. Now, other channels have Cash App, Patreon, Raffles, all kinds of gimmicks they have to make money. I haven't gone that route, and I don't think I ever will. Like I said, I'm not in it for the money. I also don't just pump out content. Some of these guys pump out two, three videos or more a day. So I appreciate your patience while I go through the alphabet to make sure I'm putting out quality content and post up quality pictures to go with it. Again, I'm not interested in getting rich, and I have never paid anybody to appear on my channel for any video that has been posted so far. By the way, I know how some guys are able to get convicts on their show from the inside, get on the phone to tell their stories on their channels, and those individuals are getting the short end of the stick, if you ask me. But they probably don't have the time or know-how to have other people on the outside put out channels for them. But I believe some of the individuals that come on these channels are doing it more for ego than money anyways. Oh, that's another thing. I don't have anybody helping me like other channels do in making these videos. It is just me, an old dinosaur. I'm approaching my mid-60s. That's right. Pretty soon I'll be on Medicare, if it's still available. If you are interested in coming on the show as a guest and talk about your prison and jail experiences, I'd be willing to do that also. And I would donate any money made from your video to charity to youth programs which i have donated thousands and thousands of dollars over the years you can hit me up at gang prevention service at gmail.com and we can discuss that possibility once again the point of these videos is not to make people look bad i'm more like an umpire in the ball game of life just calling balls and strikes so if you're no longer involved in that life not about that life anymore i commend you for having the heart for having the corazón for having the real levels to realize what is really important in this life, and that is you, your family, and God. Today, we'll finish off the H last names. First, I'm going to start off with Salvador Sr. Hernandez Garcia, who is the father of Toro or Torito. I understand that Sr. was big into cockfighting and close to Roland Berry. I've heard some people say that he was an MM member, and some people told me that he was just an associate. I understand that Salvador Sr. was busted with Roland Berry in 2005, and that the dad had a big beef with Frankie B., which tells me he had backing by Roland Berry, or Rolo, who, although was from Watts, I think I said Barrio Grape, when actually it was Colonial Watts, but Rolo also had a lot of ties out in Fontana, and that is where the connection with Salvador Sr. seems to be. Salvador Jr., a.k.a. Torito, Hernandez Orozco was also from Blumas, but claimed Cuca. He had a J number, 14308, and was very involved in drugs via his father. Be specifically, was big into moving methamphetamine. He got out and then came back with a P number. Then he was housed at the San Bernardino County Jail, where he's very active. After his trial, he was moved to Pelican Bay Shu. He was also housed at the California Training Facility Soledad in 2016, where I believe he had a G number. Toro has very prominent Mexican mafia tats, as seen here, as well as Mexican native art on his back. He was incarcerated on attempted murder charges and also accused of issuing directives to multiple Sureño gangs in regards to tax collections and drug distribution territories. Toro was also linked to the San Manuel Indian Reservation Casino and with corrupting individuals on the res. 
including Stacy Barajas Nunez and her brother, Eric Barajas, as well as other individuals enrolled as tribal members. I'll probably have to do a special episode on that whole ordeal, but I'm sure most of you heard about it. Just know that Toro was very involved there in the Inland Empire, and I'll probably do several episodes about major incidents that happened out there, including the dead president murders. A seven-month investigation by local law enforcement and the DA into the Mexican Mafia's methamphetamine business in San Bernardino County culminated in a raid in December 2006 of multiple homes across the county as well as on the res. And in that case, Salvador Toro Hernandez was identified as being the shot caller for the greater San Bernardino area, meaning that he collected taxes, percentage of profits each month from Latino gangs in the area. He also called the shots as far as who was to be targeted for, for homicides. I think I've mentioned it before in other videos, but a lot of times the females, the señoras, the wives or girlfriends of these guys, will carry out business while they're incarcerated. And such was the case of Sal's wife, Janet. She was accused of using violence to force local street gangs to pay her the taxes, which then she sent on to her husband via money filters. In 2009, just one bust, including Janet, rounded up 37 people and confiscated seven guns and meth. Over the course of the investigation, officials confiscated more than 36000 in cash, more than six pounds of meth, two pounds of cocaine, and 12 firearms. Local law enforcement also stated that they foiled several plots where the MA or their Sureño emissaries were going to carry out homicides. Eventually, Sal Hernandez pled guilty to the attempted murder of an unidentified man in 2006. It is also stated that Sal Hernandez sought to take out a hit on the San Bernardino County DA, Mike Ramos, who is seen here at one of our ILJA conferences. They also sought to take out the San Bernardino police chief. While Sal was free, he used his will to enforce total control over gangs like Isai Riba, as well as gangs like Westside Verdugo, which is broken down into smaller clicas like 7th Street locals in the Little Counts. Toro had a demonstrated history of wiping out those who had or might betray him. An illustration of this is the Andrew Huero Verde Rodriguez case. Rodriguez was from Verdugo, and he passed on a lot of information to his wife, Carmen Gutierrez Rodriguez. It is believed that Toro sent out a hit team of local gangsters and had Carmen killed. Shortly thereafter, Huero Verde committed suicide. I'll get more into that when I get to the R's and talk about the Rodriguez case. He was indicted on a federal case and sent to Hazleton in 2021. He is currently housed at Hazleton and scheduled for release at the end of 2029. Armando Pato Herrera was from Wilmas. I show he had a B number and was active with the AMA in the early 1970s before he decided to drop out. There was also an earnest Spider Herrera from Wilmas. Spider was known as being somewhat of a J-cat and was either, either a member or an associate. He was allegedly involved in several homicides including that of Shark Cyril, who was allegedly the designer of the Nuestra Familia emblem. This occurred at DVI in the mid-1970s. I understand he was housed at San Quentin in the 1980s, and I'm not sure what happened to him after that. Mike Perico Herrera was from Temple Street and involved with Mara Salvatrucha shot caller Nelson Comandari at one time. Richard Richie Herrera was out of Cuca and had an H number. I show he was involved with the MA in the 1990s, but I lost track of him after 2012. Ronald Iki Rania Herrera was out of Santa Bruta. He had an A number and was involved in the MA in the 1970s. I also show that he was popped in New Mexico in 1985 and came back with a T number after that, but is no longer in custody. Robert Dopey Inojos was out of Paramount, Brown Nation. I understand he was sponsored in the MA by Joker Gonzalez and Mosca Torres. He entered CDC in 2000 and was involved in the murder of Hector Perico Vasquez in 2016. Dopey is currently housed at Northern Kern State Prison. Next, I'm going to talk about the Hirsch brothers. These individuals were well known to my mentor, Robert Mocha Morrell, as they were all out of hazard. And I have a little story to tell you. I was rolling through hazard with LAPD gang unit one day 
when I came upon a car wash fundraiser for one of their dead homeboys. And I saw a veterano kind of supervising the whole operation. When he seen us roll up in the Mark LAPD car, he immediately came up to introduce himself as being Arthur Huero Tres Hirsch and handed me his business card. I thought that was pretty bold because he spotted us almost as soon as we spotted him. Art, a.k.a. Huero Tres Hirsch, did time in the YA in the early 60s and was very involved in the MA in the mid-1970s as were his brothers, Danny, Raymond, a.k.a. Popone, who was one of the first MM members, but ended up switching over to the Familia Cinco in 1972. And just FYI, if you haven't heard before, Familia Cinco was not the predecessor to the Nuestra Familia. Familia Cinco started after the shoe war. It did consist of Mexican Mafia members and NF members who did not like the way those organizations were being run. As I said previously, I'll have to do a special episode on Familia Cinco and how that all played out. There was also Rudolph, a.k.a. Rudy Hirsch, who was M.A. in the 1960s. And there may have been even some more. Moko told me it was a huge family. And they had a lot of influence in Hazard and still did even at that time, which was 2002. Rosalio Ross Izquierdo was from Verdugo and was an early Mexican Mafia member who had an A number. There was Raul Huero Hogin from Chiques. He had an A number, 47064. And understand his cousins or primos were the models. I think I may have stated that Manuel, a.k.a. Chapo, and Robert Papitas were either cousins or brothers. I did verify by a family member they were brothers, but Huero Hogin was documented as being their cousin. Then we have Gabriel Sleepy Huerta. I'll probably have to do a, a solo episode on Sleepy. Sleepy, a.k.a. Big Sleepy from Wilmas, was a very young Mexican Mafia member who quickly became entrenched in the organization, especially after he took out a hit on Nico Velasquez in 1988 at Tehachapi. Right after that, he was sold up with Kilroy Roy Ball in 1989, and he tried to take Kilroy out. And it was a big reason why Kilroy went over to Victory Outreach. These two individuals, as well as Mo Farrell, as I discussed previously, supposedly had made a peace treaty with the BGF, which I was told by Captain Knowles and Lieutenant Gonzalez at Folsom Prison, who ran the gang unit in the 1980s, that Joe was totally against any truces with the BGF. And he told them, Chale, I wonder what Joe would think about the agreement to end hostilities today. Anyways, Sleepy ended up being moved to Pelican Bay, was housed there for many years. But ironically, he was one of the co-signers on the end of hostilities agreement with the BGF, Nuestra Familia, and Aryan Brotherhood. Sleepy was very close to Raul Guadalajara Leon and Jorge Guadalajara Caballo Gonzalez while he was housed at Pelican Bay. He would also use the name Cochipo, which is Nawa for Sleepy. After the Todd Ashker lawsuit was successful in kicking many of these guys out of the shoe, Sleepy was housed in Sentinella in 2016, where he is still housed, being 64 years of age. I'll make a quick mention here of the Hughes brothers. They were out of Brasic Grande. One had a C number, 29017. Another one had a C number, 29374. And another one had a D number, 13505. That youngest one was the one I had at C facility. But anyways, I remember him being pointed out to me by the gang squad, in particular, investigator Charlie Davis, as being very much entrenched in Mexican Mafia politics during the 1990s. Charlie, I think you're down there in Tejas now, retired. I hope you're doing good. If you listen to this episode, hit me up. I'd like to hear from you because you taught me a lot about the Mexican Mafia. And lastly, we have Vincent N.K. Chente Cortado out of Pomona. He was stabbed by Arturo Chino Padua at New Folsom in 1988 while I worked there. He later dropped out and was, was an influential member in the Pesetas, or Two Fives, being one of the early members of that dropout organization. I covered D.O. gangs in a previous episode, if you're interested in getting a brief rundown of some of the major D.O. gangs that are currently operating in CDC. I hope you enjoyed this episode and come back for many more. No olvides, do everything you do in life con razón. Do everything you do in life con corazón. For now, this is Gabe Morales signing off for Gangsters, Cops, and Politicians. <laughs>